I'm here with Lisa Jenkins. She is the founder and CEO of Kingdom Builders Family Life Center. And April is actually a really special month for a couple of reasons for Lisa and just for all of us in general um, for us to know about. So I want to dive right into it. Lisa, thank you for joining me. And how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me today. I do want to ask, um, are you able to share a little bit about who you are, how you've gotten to this point in your life and a little bit of your background? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am um, a mother, a grandma of four now. I have eight children and my husband for the last 20 years. Um, I live in Colorado Springs um, with my family. We've been here since 2012 um, and I founded the organization in 2013. So I'm originally from South Carolina, um, and that's where home is. But again, now I'm a Coloradan is what they call it now. <laughs> I've been here now. This year be um, actually 11 years in May, next, yeah, next month. Awesome. Awesome. That is so wonderful to hear. Now, um, you are celebrating the 10th anniversary of Kingdom Builders Family Life Center. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that is and your journey to making your center? Absolutely. Um, so our main focus and mission is to change the narrative for individuals, families, and youth who've been affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. And we do that through case management advocacy. We provide them with mentorship, um, a lot of education, and then also uh, um, supportive services such as financial, um, safe housing, and whatever they need to be successful and remove themselves out of that situation is what we provide in our, our program structure. Um, and as I mentioned, I celebrate 10 year. Um, I started the journey because I am now a thriver. I don't call myself a survivor anymore because I've overcome that. But I'm a th thriver of domestic violence from my first marriage. Um, I was 19 when I got married. So by the time I was 24, I was escaping with my three small children. Um, and I left that marriage and I never looked back. But I knew um, while I was in it, if God saved me during that, because he tried to kill me the night I left, but I knew and I promised God that if he saved me from that night, I would spend the rest of my life working with others who've been affected, trying to get them to the place where they're also able to get out of that situation and never look back. So that's been my focus for the last 10 years. Um, it's been a blessing. It's been great to see the journey um, because I started with not knowing anything about this journey, but now here we are 10 years later, and we have really impacted a lot of lives here in Colorado Springs, and our journeys continue to expand throughout some of the other states where we want to focus on satellite offices of what we do here in Colorado. That is really an incredible story. I want to ask, you know, on this journey with building Kingdom Builders, um, you know, did you ever envision it becoming this large or did in your heart were you like, this is just really, uh, I'm in my community, this is for my community, or did you really have this like huge impactful vision? I did, I, I saw a big picture. Um, it was so big that I had no idea how I was gonna accomplish it. And so that's why I knew that this was a God focused thing because God gives us small things that we can accomplish we probably would take credit for it, right? I can't take credit for anything that I'm doing with Kingdom Builders because it's such, it's so bigger than me. Um, and it's bigger than Colorado Springs as well because we're changing lives and we know that the next level needs to be taking what we've created here and taking it to other areas that need the support as well. Incredible. What would you say was kind of that moment in this journey where you were like, it's time for me to now go from what I'm currently working on and really now develop that bigger picture? I think back in 2018. So I be, so I started the organization in 2013, but I didn't become full-time until 2018. So I was working a full-time job as a government, as an advocate in the United States government on Fort Carson. Um, and so I was secure. I had my benefits and things like that, but I knew that I could not take the organization any further being part-time. So I told my husband, you know, I've got to resign. I had no clue of how that was going to happen because I was getting paid pretty good with the government, but I realized that Kingdom Builders was my focus. So I wrote a few grants and, you know, I prayed about it and things. And in 2018, I was able to get enough funding for me to then resign from the government. And I, and I now full-time employee with Kingdom Builders. And that was where it was like, wow, if I can do this, and it's been continuing on, 
every year I have no problems with, you know, making sure I can take care of my family financially through the organization. But I knew that what I had was special. I've, I've done a couple of conferences that are out of state. And every time I tell my story about what we're doing, it's like, you know, this is so needed in our area where we're at. So that's what makes me know that definitely we need to expand. Um, and our first one would be in South Carolina where I'm home. That's my home um, because there's a lot of domestic violence, um, sexual assault and human trafficking type things in that area as well. So we want to take that and take it on um, and maybe other areas as well. Incredible. I do want to ask, I mean, um, just because we're really coming out of COVID and, you know, things are starting to appear what would seem more normal again. Um, how how did you kind of see an effect in this? I know we heard reports of, you know, unfortunately, people who have suffered from domestic violence with COVID happening. It really was such an incredibly sad and destructive time in their lives. Like, how, how did you see an impact on your end of like being an advocate and stepping in with supportive services? How were you affected and how is your business affected? Right. We saw increased numbers um, because if you're in a home that's filled with violence and you become isolated to the point where now you're in the home on a regular basis with the person, like on an hourly basis, on the person that's causing harm, you're going to always see the increase because the violence is not going to stop. And it, it also became a point where there was no um, support because they everybody was kind of like, oh, we got to be in your homes. You know, the COVID is there. You can't go this place and that place. So it increased. But but we were blessed to be able to provide coverage the entire time. We, we didn't close our doors, maybe for that first month when everybody had to stay home because we had to try to figure out what was going on. But we continue to see an increase. And when people who are in homes that fill with violence, if they know they have that support and they can get out, they're going to get out because people don't stay in homes with violence because they want to do that. They, they feel like that's the only option. How most of them are having families with uh, multiple children. And if they can't provide financially and that person that's causing the harm is, they tend to stay in it. So we want to break that stigma of, I have to stay in it because of this. So if we're able to bless them with the services. We can get you out if you're ready to go. We've had a lot where they, that's where they their focus was. So um, yes, it's been an increase, um, and it's continuing to be an increase just because of domestic violence is a learned behavior. Um, the person that causes harm, they're going to continue to cause the harm until they're getting the services they need to know that that's not okay. And how do they break that? Absolutely, I do want to ask. Would you say you kind of had any um, additional services added on since then, any type of virtual services or anything like that, that people could reach out and, you know, kind of get guidance or advice? Yeah, absolutely. So when COVID happened, a lot of our education classes, we did make them on a, a platform, virtual platform. So we have that accessibility. Um, and then we just want to be an ear. We also have a, on our website, there's an actual chat. Um, software that we have on there. So if there's someone that's experiencing domestic violence, even if they're not in our state, they can still chat with one of our um, on-call staff people to really figure out, like, can you help me develop a safety plan? I'm in Tennessee or wherever. You know, we're willing to support, even if our services is not reaching that far, we're still able to support and at least getting some information or helping them navigate through some of those systematic um things that they may not know about and giving them that support. So um, we're, we're blessed to be able to have that opportunity for sure. That's incredible. I do want to shift gears a little bit and kind of mention that, um, as obviously you know, and you're more of an industry expert on this, is that April is both Sexual Assault Awareness Month and Child Abuse Awareness Month. And I know we were just talking a little bit about some of your programs, um, but what have you guys also done in addition to being to able to help people and educate them? What other, um, you know, messages are you spreading out into the community to keep people who may not have ever experienced this to keep them aware and keep their eyes open and vigilant to look out for their friends, family, students, um, a friend's child, something like this? Like what other messages are you spreading out in the community? Yeah, absolutely. So we have an active social media um, presence. We have a social media manager. And so she aggressively posts on a five days a week, actually, on stats on um, sexual assault and child abuse, as well as ways of helping. Um, and then we also, each, 
each Wednesday this month, we've had this is, today is our third one. We have what's called Cake and Conversation. Um, that's actually we open our doors between 11 and 1 um, on Wednesdays and um, invite the, the community to come out and have a conversation, get a tour of our, our services, um, come in and seeing all of our staff, meeting us, and just sitting down and being intentional and let's talking about the topics. Um, and then we also have an information packet that we give everyone. It has statistics on it and how um, to be an active bystander when you're seeing something that's happening, how, what do you do about it? And so we've been intentional in doing that because we realize educating the community on these subjects is what where the change will happen. Education and providing those resources for those who are being affected. Right, right. I also kind of want to ask, just because we're more on like an, um, talking about some some things that are a little bit more on a national, um, you know, topic of conversation. Could you share some facts and statistics around domestic violence and and other topics similar to this so people can understand the the vast, like how big it is. And it's oh, yeah, not absolutely. like a one off, two off thing. It's it's a much larger problem. Absolutely. So I actually pulled off some statistics. So nationally, um, we do, we'll start with domestic violence. Um, and this came from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And in the United States, more than 10 million adults experience domestic violence annually. Um, each of those uh, adults experience only one incidence of violence, and adults in the U.S. would experience violence every three seconds. One in four women and one in 10 men experience sexual violence, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner. And that in a typical day, domestic violence national hotlines, they receive over 19,000 calls of, of, of those wanting support. Just alone in our state, in they, they we just had our um, stats for 2021. They're, they're always a year behind, but we have, we've had 91 um, fatalities of domestic violence here in our in Colorado. Um, and that's a lot of lives that have been lost. Um, and then not, not including those casualties or the family members or those that have left behind. So the, the numbers are astonishing, um, but that's just domestic violence. Um, and I pulled off um, some for the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. One in five women in the United States experienced completed or attempted rape during their lifetime. Um, nearly a quarter of men in the U.S. experienced some form of contact sexual violence in their lifetime. Nationwide, 81% of women and 43% of men reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment or assault in their lifetime. One in three female victims of completed or attempted rape experienced it by the time between the ages of 11 and 17. And about one in four males of completed or attempted rape first experienced it between the ages of 11 and 17. Yeah, once again, very high numbers. And so I'm now I'm going to give you some information about child abuse because they all sometimes, especially with domestic violence, child abuse kind of plays hand in hand with that. Now, child abuse, more than 600,000 children are abused in the U.S. each year. Um, and an estimated 618,000 children abuse and, and neglect in 2020. And that's the recent year for data. Um, and so that's the numbers. Um, and that's why it's so important to be able to educate, not only educating those who are uh, potentially um, can become victimized, but those who are already in it, you know, and they're experiencing that. They need to know that if there's a, a child in the home, the child is suffering as well. So they need also to be able to be protected. Family members, they may know someone that is experiencing domestic violence or have experienced sexual assault as well, but there's help. The only way that we can change this is we have to educate and also become active bystanders. We have to know if there's something going on, educate yourself on how you can support your, your, your family member or your friend. You don't have to intervene if it's not safe for you, but you can give them those resources. You can become that support person that when they're, when they're ready to leave, then they'll, know, they'll feel safe and know that you've not isolated them and that they can come to you and you will have those um, tools that you can give them to get them safely um, supported. Absolutely. I have to ask something a little bit controversial, especially on the lines of child abuse. Uh, it seems like more and more every day you see kids online kind of um, stepping up and saying discipline 
is abuse. And I'd, I'd love to know your take on that. Is spanking considered abuse? Like, where do you draw the boundaries when it comes to disciplining your child, where it goes from either a spanking or physical abuse or setting the boundary of saying, hey, that's not acceptable, or I'm asking you to do chores because you have to learn responsibility. So right. where is that line or where where do you see kind of that line being drawn? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I was also um, a part of the Child Protective Services. I took some classes when I was in. Abuse only happens when it when you are responding out of anger, when you are disciplinary, because, you know, some people believe in um, disciplinary based physical. Um, I, I choose not to um, do that anymore with my children because I was a young mom. And so I did, you know, spank because that's what I knew. But I um, now it's more of if I'm going to, you know, spank or whatever they want to call the word, you're not doing it out of anger, but you're doing it out. OK, I'm re I'm trying to redirect a, a, a behavior. Um, but there's there's so much education now that you really don't even have to physically discipline a child. You know, there's a lot of education on um, positive parenting of how to be able to do different things. And, and that's where I became educated on it. So if parents say, you know what, I spank my child. I always tell them, as long as you, if you decide that's what you're going to do, of course, the law doesn't say you can't spank your child. It only comes when it's repeated uh, abusive means where you're doing it out of anger and you and you leave marks and things of that sort. That's when sometimes the, the law enforcement will come in, but they won't do it if, you, if that's the culture that you're in and you're, you're saying, I'm disciplined because of that. It's just excessive and it's repeated um, punishment out of anger, if that makes sense. So that's kind of where I where I um, advocate for my families and kind of explain to them because we, you're not going to tell a, a parent that's raising their child, you shouldn't spank. But these are some of the, let's give you some other options. And if you decide to do that, make sure you're doing it because of, you know, the disciplinary rather than I'm doing it because I'm mad at what you've done. So I'm going to, you know, take that act out on you, if that makes sense. No, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's such a great way to clarify because I think that line gets blurred. And I, I feel like as we learn more about mental health and, you know, positive parenting, that line gets blurred even more. So I think that's really awesome that you're able to kind of show that there is a distinction and like, yes, there's parenting and, you know, sometimes it, it yeah. happens, it happens. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes that's the only way to be like, don't do that again. But right. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that, you know, there is kind of a cut and dry, very clear and concise answer to the difference between discipline versus child abuse. Right. Um, you know, you've you've talked about kind of being on both sides of you're a survivor and now you're a thriver. How how has, you know, being a domestic violence advocate changed your life and really not only changed your life, but impacted the people around you because they saw the change in you? Right. Absolutely. I think that when I was in my um, situation years ago, I didn't have a, a person that I could say that I could go to with, who would advocate for me. I had to learn a lot of the things I learned the hard way, but I was able to get out of it. I was able to get to the point in my life where I'm now thriving. And so me using my voice, because I've been there, I've been able to navigate through the systems of Maybe being a young mom, having to navigate and getting food stamps or uh, Medicaid or whatever those social um, um, things you can get when you're struggling as a young mom. I was able to navigate through that. Was it easy? Absolutely not. But so now I use my voice to be able to support and let them know that this is your now. This is right now. But that does, it doesn't mean you have to stay that way. You know, we don't want to get into, oh, I'm a single mom. I have this amount of kids. So. My life is just over because it's not over. You just need someone to support you along that journey. But we want to empower, not rescue. And so that's where my philosophy is in life, empower versus rescue, because when a person has come out of or in that situation, they, their power has been taken away from them. They're dependent on the person that's been causing them the harm. And so we want to empower them to let like, your voice is where it is and let's empower you to make those changes in your life. So. Um, it's been amazing. So it's, it's changed my life because I've grown. Now, I got out at 24. Now I'm 51. So it's been a long life journey for me to get to where I am now. And so I can provide that relational aspect of I understand because I was there at one point. Um, and so, yeah, it's been life changing, but it's been a great life changing thing for me. 
What would you say is one of the first kind of phrases you can tell somebody in that situation um, that is something they can tell themselves to kind of start reclaiming that power, whether they're it's their first time reaching out or they're out of the situation and they're feeling intimidated and alone or scared. Right. What's what's kind of one, you know, thing you definitely lean heavily on? You're like, hey, look, this is this is the piece of advice I always give people in this situation. Right. And nine times out of ten, it always helps lift their spirits and get them right. get the ball moving for them. Yeah, for 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 sure. I am. You are enough. Um, so I always tell them that because what happens when you are in that situation, you're beat down so much, not only physically, sometimes it's not even physical, it's the emotional part. And so they don't feel that they're worthy enough to not accept or I'm going to accept this because this person has told me that, you know, I'm this and I'm bad or whatever. But if they know that they're enough, that God created them to be this wonderful person, giving them that, letting them see that it's a bigger picture. And so then they start realizing I am enough. So I'm not going to accept certain things in my life. So that's kind of one of my staple senses. You are enough. And what I use a lot of times when I work with some of the guests that I that we serve here, and then even just being mentoring to some of the other young ladies that's not even in my program, but I've been able to work with over the years in a more intimate setting. All right. I do have one other kind of might be controversial question, and that is you mentioned earlier about um, abusers really it's kind of a, a a behavior problem they have. Do you offer services to help these people overcome this problem or do you have like sister brands or anything like that or services you recommend that are not necessarily in-house to help these people overcome their behavioral challenges and whatever is causing them to act out like this? Do you have services like that? Right. So we have not had services yet, but this is how we identify our victims. They actually, they don't have to have a police report when they come through our doors because the funding that we receive. They said they want us to be able to support. They signed a self assertion saying, I'm the victim of crime based on this statute. We have had people that have come in that have been abused as children and have been in a domestic violence their entire lives. Then they become, um, a, um, then they become in this situation, they're actually the victim. But at some point, some of the women have turned to being the, the, the person that's caused harm as well. Like they have this co-combative relationship. So we see this a lot and a lot of people don't realize is that you can be the victim in this, but at some point that anger turns, right? And so we try to give them, again, education is a lot of what that looks like. And our, also our next phase, because we realize we want to prov start providing a, a system where we're supporting the entire family. The entire family is going to be, at some point, the person that's caused harm. Um, domestic violence is a learned behavior. So that means that the person that now, yeah, I've been identified as the person that's caused harm, but they were victims at one point. So we have to realize that they have that in them because of what they've been exposed to as children. And so if we just cut them off and say, okay, they're gonna, you're going to get punished now, don't get me wrong. They should be held accountable for their actions, whether it be that they go get arrested or whatever. But if they recognize I was wrong. This is what I've done, but I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be able to change. I want to be able to do that. We're trying to develop something necessary called, it's called Roads for Redemption. And that's going to be where we can see that population go into more of a supportive services, getting that counseling, getting that um, education and support so that they can then at some point right their wrong and then have those conversations with their children or the person that they've harmed at some point where they can reconcile as far as in a safe setting where they can own up to what they've done, but now they're making those necessary changes to really change. So we haven't developed it yet, but that's kind of where I see the future for us. Because again, if you're talking about healing the entire family, that person that's caused harm in that situation has to be able to be re redeemed and be able to get that support as well. Of course, of course. How can people who are on the outside or again have never experienced any type of sexual assault, domestic violence, abuse of any type, how can they help somebody who's going through this in this moment? How can they be a support from step A to step Z? Yeah, for sure. They can listen and, and not be judgmental. Um, when someone comes to you, they trust you that they want you to know what's going on. So initially, 
of course, as family members, we tend to say, what are you doing? You don't need to be in that situation. Why are you allowing this person to do X, Y, Z? And so that causes a person to kind of close their shell back because they're feeling like they're not supported. So the first step is to support and allow them to have room to be able to say what they feel and then they'll and tell them, how do you need my support rather than, well, I want to do this, 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 and this. And you're trying to basically plan all of this um, great opportunities for them, but they may not be ready at that moment to leave. Because with domestic violence, it takes sometimes seven times um, before a person's ready to leave. That's a long time. And it could be a long time. Some people can take real quick seven times. One time it could be enough for some, but average is seven. So that means that that person needs to be able to make their own decision. Don't take that for them, but create that safe space where when you're ready, I'm here to support you. And so by supporting is helping them come up with a safety plan. If you don't know how to do one yourself, reach out to any domestic violence organization that's in your state. Even reach out to us, even if we're not in your state, to find out how can I support my friend and come up with a safety plan and let the professionals help guide the process rather than you initially trying to take it because you may take on more than you are um, um, educated enough to do and experience, and it could cause more harm if you don't do it the right way. Right, right. Absolutely. I was actually about to ask that I have heard that statistic before where it, it takes a person of domestic violence about seven times before they're able to leave um, that situation. So thank you for answering that question, of, of course. course. Um, yeah, no, that is one I am familiar with. I do have to ask, you know, what's next for you? I know you're talking about expansion and, you know, different programs you're potentially going to be offering down the road and, you know, making this more than just a Colorado Springs, it's an everywhere thing. So what else can people expect from you and your brand and what you're planning on doing? Oh, absolutely. So my, my plan is to continue um, speaking out against um, some of that, educating the community. Um, I, I, I want to be able to use my voice and my experiences um, to be able to share with others who may be going through it and as an inspiration. So my brand, I am Lisa Jenkins. We're developing that. Um, and that's more than just kingdom builders. It's more than just being a mom. It's more than being a wife. It's just so much more because I have a story to tell. And I really want to share it um, with everyone that to encourage and empower others to be able to make changes as well. So, yeah, that's what's next for me. Just being able to get out more and, and sharing and educating uh, and just being a voice for the voiceless in our communities. Absolutely. How can people stay up to date with you, follow you on social medias, get in touch with Kingdom Builders Family Life Center, all that that stuff where they can get all that good information? Oh, absolutely. So we are on um, Facebook as well as Instagram on KBFLC, the number two. Um, and then we also have our website, www.kbflc.org. That's where we share all of our events, where we share if anyone wants to donate to the cause, because we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so we are charity um, based where we can receive donations um, and get tax credits. And then also we're developing the I Am Lisa Jenkins brand as well. Uh, we have a IamLisaJenkins.com website. It's basically right now just being in the development stage, um, as well as social media. We'll be able to find my speaking engagements, also life lessons. We're also about to uh, launch a, a, a podcast as well. We will be talking about some of the subjects and topics that I've been you know, dealing with my journey these last 50, 51 years. Incredible, incredible. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. And guys, if you loved this conversation, um, you can head over to all my social media at it's me underscore Alyssa D, where you can see all my exclusive interviews just like this. And Lisa, thank you again so much for joining me. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to speak with you and really hear some up-to-date and relevant and new and current statistics on such a serious and un of unfortunate situation a lot of people find themselves in. So thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You have a wonderful Absolutely. Day. Awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. If you're looking for more exclusive content, just like this conversation I had with Lisa Jenkins, who's the founder and CEO of Kingdom Builders 
Family and Life Center. You can download the free Odyssey app today. That's A-U-D-A-C-Y. And while you're there, make sure you favorite Star 94 Atlanta. Um, just click that little plus sign in the top right-hand corner of your screen. And make sure you stay up to date with all things we're doing at Star 94 Atlanta by following us on all social media at Star 94 Atlanta. And thank you again for your time, guys. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.